Hey guys and welcome to chapter 6 topic 1. Chapter 6 talks all about DNA replication and repair and we're going to talk about this in three different topics. Topic 1 we're going to stick with just DNA replication. Hopefully this is a big review section for you after um, Biology 201 at CWI or at another campus. So hopefully this won't, won't be too much but we're going to go through all the parts that play a role in DNA replication because it's really important that we understand how this happens. Oops. Okay, so first we have our objectives. As always, these are what I expect you to have mastered before our next exam, so please let me know if you have any questions about it. So as I said, this topic is all about DNA replication, and so there's some main points that we're going to talk about, and so it's important that you understand these, and this is how we're going to go through it, is base pairing, replication origins, replication forks, DNA polymerase, the leading strand, the lagging strand, DNA polymerase, error prevention, the RNA primer, and then we're going to review the whole thing and wrap up, just as they are at the end, telomerases. So first we need to talk about base pairing. We talked about this a lot in Chapter 5, but remember that adenine will always pair with thymine and cytosine will always pair with guanine. So when we do DNA replication, these bases will always pair together. Now DNA replication will always will always happen in a semi-conservative manner. This means that we have a template strand which came from the parent strand and then we have the new strand being formulated and you can see that on the graphic here on this slide where the red backbone is the new strand and the orange backbone is the template strand. This means that we're never that we never have completely brand new uh, DNA and this allows for a lot of proofreading mechanisms that we're going to talk about in the future. Don't forget that beyond the base pairing, that these are always anti-parallel in 5' prime to 3' prime, because this is going to play a role in the directionality of replication that we're going to talk about here in just a second. So make sure you have a good handle on that. So where do we start in replication? We start at the origin. So some chromosomes have multiple origins, some have just one. Eukaryotes, we have multiple, because if you consider how long our, our chromosomes are, we need to have multiple uh, origins so that we can get through it as fast as possible. These origins of replication usually contain a whole lot of adenine thymine bases. It has a good signal as to where this is. And you'll see that it open um, that it's there. Now we know that PCR has to occur, which is polymerase chain reaction, the way we replicate DNA artificially, has to occur at really high temperatures in the cell, and that's so that we can break those bonds to open this up. Now in the cell we have enzymes that are going to do that for us, and we're going to talk about those here in just a second with helicase. But as they break that up, it's more energetically favorable to keep a single-stranded part of DNA open that's very short. We don't keep a very large sequence. We don't go through and open the whole thing up and then replicate. We just keep a very small segment, and as that segment's replicated, we open a little bit more and a little bit more. And this forms the replication forks. So helicase is our enzyme that will open up the DNA and it's going to move in both directions of the fork. So we have that bubble, the origin of replication bubble, and then it's going to move in both directions across the DNA. So it's important to be aware of that because we usually think of this one direction because we almost always see the pictures with a fork heading off in one direction, but don't forget the other side of the bubble is going in its own direction as well. And so that is going to lead to a couple issues when we talk about the leading strand and lagging strand. But remember that these forks um, are in two directions. And they move pretty quickly, though. We can do replication at about a thousand base pairs per second. So this is a pretty rapid event, but we still need to have multiple ones so that we can get through everything quickly. So the first um, enzyme we need to talk about that actually goes through replication, so we have helicase, which opens the fork. Now we have polymerase. And we had them um, grouped as separate ones in your B201 class, and in our textbook, it, they just call them all polymerases. So you're free to either differentiate or not. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't really matter in here. But DNA polymerase is always the enzyme that's responsible for adding new bases to the DNA backbone. And it only can add nucleotides in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction of the newly synthesized molecule. This directionality is really important because of the fact that this is going to create a lagging strand here for us in just a second. Now, as you can see from the image at the bottom, DNA polymerase looks like a hand. And what it does is it helps use that with the shape of the nucleotides to bring in that new one and have it fit. And as you can see through this process, we have um, a little bit of the triphosphate, or we lose two phosphate groups to help that come off, 
with some energy being for or being utilized to help build this process because remember this is a process that would need energy and as I keep talking about we have two different strands being formed at the same time we have the leading strand and the lagging strand and that's because DNA polymerase can only work in one direction and that is why it's important to understand that so we're going to walk through both these here in just a second and both these, the leading and the lagging strand, I have videos of them on Blackboard and I would really encourage you to watch those videos because it's a lot better than looking at these static pictures. So please, please, please consider looking up those videos that I have in the supplemental materials folders. So leading strand occurs on both sides of the bubble as you can see here. There's one on the top and one on the bottom. So both sides of this replication fork, or the replic origin of replication rather, will have a leading and a lagging strand component. It's not one or the other, even though we simplify it by drawing it that way. And so what happens with the leading strand is we start and then polymerase will just keep following along and it'll stay right up to the edge of helicase unwrapping the DNA and it moves in continuous fashion. So there's nothing that stops it, it just keeps on trucking. And so it just moves on as it needs to go. However, the lagging strand is a whole different story because of the fact that DNA polymerase can only move in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. This is a problem because the DNA is open in the 3 to 5' prime direction. So what happens is DNA polymerase will jump onto the sequence, replicate essentially in a backwards direction, and then fall off once it's reached the end. It can't follow the replication fork because the replication fork is moving in the opposite direction. And as I said, that lagging strand is going to have um, is going to be occurring on both sides of that replication bubble. So it's important to know that these segments of DNA that are being formed are known as Okazaki fragments. And what's going to happen is at some point we're going to have um, ligase come in and seal the gaps between these um, between these segments. But first, we have a DNA polymerase that's going to remove the RNA primer that you see here and then it's going to seal the gaps with ligase and then we have a new a new strand. However though this doesn't form nearly as fast as leading strands and this is why it's known as the lagging strand. So that in a nutshell is how replication occurs but what about errors? We've talked about mutations a lot already in this class even though we're only in chapter 6 and so we need to understand where mutations come from and part of them can come from the replication process. However, DNA polymerase is really, really careful about this. They only make, er the enzyme only makes errors between 1 and 10 to the 7th and 1 10 to the 9th times, which is more than 1 in a million times. And that's because this uh, enzyme has two ways of checking. It has a base pair mismatching and a proofreading mechanism that's checked as well. And let's look at both of these processes. So the first is in the error prevention in the first place. It uses base pair matching to make sure that it's going to match up. And this just simply happens by if physical check. If you have a um, two purines bound to each other, the, uh, the double-stranded uh, helix is going to be bent in in the middle because it's too small. Or too big, I'm sorry, purines are, are the bigger ones. So it's going to have this bubble, this gouge out. And so it'll be able to feel that that's not the appropriate shape. Same thing goes for two pyrimidines. They will be indented in so that you can see that you can it can feel the difference in the size. And so this is the first line of defense is this base pair mismatch. But if it doesn't catch it, there's this other process called the exonucleolytic proofreading. This actually occurs at a second whoops. This actually occurs at a second site on the and on the polymerase 3 enzyme. And you can see that happening here. So what will happen is when the proofreading, if the base pair mess match doesn't get caught, there's a kink in the DNA sequence. And this actually stops polymerase from moving forward. This is that second catalytic site will then go in the opposite direction, the 3 to 5 prime, uh, or 5 to 3 prime, and remove it and replace it with the appropriate one. So then that will allow it to continue forward. And remember, this is a second active site from the one that's actively adding the base pair. So we have the uh, base pair mismatch and then the proofreading. And so it's important to understand that those two combined help make sure that DNA does not have it many errors during the replication process. So I mentioned this before, but it's important to note is that the RNA primer 
DNA polymerase can't just latch onto DNA, it's incapable of doing that. So it has to have an RNA primer put into place. And in this place, we use an enzyme called RNA um, primase. And I know that the picture here says DNA primase, and that's just a nomenclature thing that your textbook authors are using. But it's RNA primer put on by the primase. And so what happens then is this primer is put on, it's kind of like a hold, like if you're rock climbing, that then the polymerase can jump on and help move forward in the, um, in the sequence. So this can't happen without that. The lagging strand will have a whole bunch of primers put down, whereas the leading strand only needs one to get started. So let's look at our whole replication machine. You can see this happening here. So we have DNA helicase, which is the big uh, yellow structure that's opening up the, um, the DNA. And we have single strand binding proteins that are help, helping to keep this DNA open. We then on the leading strand have the DNA polymerase with the help of the sliding clamp. And we'll talk about the sliding clamp here in just a second, which holds it onto the DNA and helps it move forward. And this one's moving in the direction of that helicase. Now at the bottom side, we have the RNA primer, where the primer is going to add the pri or the RNA primase, which is going to add the primer to the sequence that will allow the polymerase on the lagging strand to catch up and create an Okazaki fragment that will then have the a second DNA polymerase and ligase come in to help seal the gaps between those DNA segment, seg segments. So you can see them here, what we just talked about. So we see the he, uh, the helicase as it opens up the DNA. Remember, this is going to take a lot of energy, just as you would need to, if you need to boil the solutions for uh, the PCR process to work, you're definitely going to need a lot of energy in the helicase. And that's what helicase helps do, do is it uses its enzymatic activity to lower that energy barrier to allow the DNA to be opened. DNA does not like to be opened. It likes to be coiled. We then have the primase, which adds the primer so that the polymerase can jump onto the, um, to the molecule. And then we have DNA polymerase, which will go and add the base pairs. DNA polymerase needs a sliding clamp. It's this extra protein that comes along that helps get the DNA polymerase on the DNA and helps hold it onto the DNA so it doesn't just fall off. And then it'll move forward. We also have those single-stranded binding proteins, and that's what helps keep that DNA open. As I said, it doesn't like to be open, so these proteins will bind to it to keep it from, from binding back on itself. The last one we need to talk about is telomerase. Telomerase is really important, so we have these telomeres at the end of our DNA sequence. And what's going to happen is that DNA polymerase will never be able to code all the way to the end of the DNA because of the functionality, because of that 5 to 3 prime on one side, it's always going to be cut off short. So what we have instead is we have these telomeres. These telomeres are just long sequences of DNA that don't make, um, that don't, uh, that don't have any coding responsibility. And these will get shortened over time. But what we have to help prevent these from being totally shortened really quickly is telomerases. And telomerases are this enzyme that goes back and adds a little bit more um, RNA sequence to the very end that then allows the DNA to copy some of that. We're still going to lose some of our telomeres, and this is what actually contributes to our age, uh, to aging within our cells. But we do conserve a lot more of it because of these telomerases. So this is the end of topic one. Please review all the enzymes we just talked about. As I said, replication should be fairly familiar to you, but if you need to go through it a little bit more in depth, please let me know and we'll talk about it in class.